This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. Massive wildfires have appeared on every continent except Antarctica. Now it is hitting Australia, even at the end of winter there, with temperatures about 10 degrees C over 20 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. Over 130 bushfires were crackling over Australia in early September. A veteran Australian fire expert warns climate change makes the risk much worse, and it may break down the country's fire defense system eventually. And now, strangely, a change high above Antarctica makes this year's fire season even more ominous. We have reached Greg Mullins, former Commissioner of Fire and Rescue for New South Wales, for 13 years until his retirement in 2017. Greg has represented Australia for groups of Asian fire chiefs and the United Nations. He currently sits on the Climate Council, the publicly funded climate watchdog. From Sydney, Greg Mullins, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Hi, Alex. How are you? Pretty good, thank you. So, Greg, you've been directing bushfires for a long time. What is different in the last couple of years? Well, look, I've I've been fighting fires since 1972, and my father before me um, was a volunteer wildland firefighter from 1955. And we watched as the climate in Australia changed, and particularly in the mid-1990s, now after... California had its 1993 firestorm. We had our 1994 firestorm in January that year. Um, About 800 fires in the state of New South Wales alone, millions of acres burnt, um, hundreds of homes lost. Now, that came out of the blue. You can normally see the indicators of a bad season coming along. And I remember my father just shaking his head and saying, "I, I just didn't see this coming. And Look, before that, scientists were starting to sound the alarm about climate change. I had a deep interest in ecology and the environment and fire, of course, and I've been talking to a lot of scientists and they started to explain how just a tiny little increase in temperature changes everything and we're bearing the brunt of it here now. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we used to look forward to our summers, Greg, and now it's become a season that comes with a lot of worry and some fear. Uh, I've got a little emergency get-out-of-town-quick pack still sitting behind me. The season isn't quite over. Are Australians worried about the annual round of smoke and flames? Look, Alex, we are, and the reason, it's it's always been a part of the landscape. It's one of the driest continents in the world here, um, the outback, the centre of Australia is very arid. But around the coastal fringe, the forests and then the grasslands, very fire prone. Now, in my state, I, I live in Sydney, um, the state of New South Wales on the east coast. Our bushfire season officially runs from 1st of October to 31st of March. Now, that was based on over a century of observations by meteorologists. We now start our season in the first week of August. Two months earlier, every year, we're getting major fires. And as you said in the introduction, we have over half a million acres on fire in the north of our state right now. Um, There's five major blazes that have been burning for weeks in remote areas, but about 30 homes have been lost already. In our state, 17 just north of the border. This is unheard of, or it had been unheard of for decades, but it is our new normal. So people are very worried. Fires are penetrating into areas where they've never been before. And I mean, wet temperate rainforest, um, subtropical and tropical rainforest. Fires are burning very intensely through those areas because it's so dry. We're getting less rainfall, higher temperatures, stronger winds. And with the drier fuels, very, very intense fires. We're just not getting a grip on I was shocked when a couple of years ago there were wildfires in northern Tasmania where you expect it to be a rainforest. They said some of those trees hadn't burned in a thousand or more years, and and yet it appeared even there. Look, this is just shocking. So Tasmania, a big island to the... It's a southern state, but it's an island state to the south of Australia. Their major fire seasons used to be about 30 years apart, and it was quite rare. It wasn't seen as a really bushfire-prone state. Um, But when they did get fires, they were big ones. They were normally on the east coast in dry sclerophyll forest. So 
a lot of Tasmania is highlands and wilderness and it's wet, temperate rainforest, old Gondwana um, forest that's been there for millions and millions of years, hosted dinosaurs. <laughs> that's how old it is. It's drying out. The reduction in rainfall over the last 20, 30 years is immense and it's now burning freely and scientists have looked at the trees, the rings on the trees, the carbon record in the soil. They've never had intense fires like we've had in 2006, um, 2013, 2016, 2018, 2019. So you can see it's 30 years apart. It's just about every year now we have major fires in Tasmania. So hue and pine trees, which can live for 3,000 years, um, the second oldest living things on the planet, they're burning and they won't come back. Um, they, they're not adapted to fire and scientists are saying, look, it's unlikely they'll grow back. And Greg, you've warned that if the fire season keeps extending like this, Australia's method of sharing firefighters and equipment could break down. Could you tell us about that, please? Yes, well, look, this is what's got every fire chief in Australia worried and um, we're a bit different to the US and Canada. We we don't have local municipal fire depart- departments there statewide. So my fire department, Fire and Rescue New South Wales, um, 340 fire stations, about 7,000 firefighters, 6,000 volunteers, big, big organisations. So there's not as many fire chiefs. We get together regularly. Uh, what the paradigm of firefighting in Australia has been for decades is um, a progressive onset of fire seasons from north to south. The state of Queensland would have a fire season starting in maybe late July, but not very severe. They very rarely lost homes there. They were fairly mild fires compared to the southern states. Um, We'd move into my state, New South Wales, around September, October. By then, Queensland could release their firefighters to come south to help us, and the southern states could help us. Our season would moderate a bit um, early in the next year and we would go south and help help the other states. What we're having now is simultaneous severe fire seasons and it's stopping us sending people across borders. The other thing that we're experiencing, we lease all of our large firefighting aircraft, um, C-130 Hercules, 737, 15,000-litre water bombers, Ericsson Sky Air Cranes, they come from North America. Um, now, the extending fire season in California is a problem for us because that equipment's not available like it used to be. Um, we had fires last year in August that destroyed homes, and again this year we didn't have the large aircraft. So in New South Wales, our government just bought a single 737. But even when all the leased aircraft arrive, there'll only be seven large aircraft in the whole of Australia with about four or five air cranes and then a whole lot of medium and small water bombers, fixed wing and rotary wing. And we're finding it's just not enough. So it's very difficult. It's a vast country with a relatively small population, very long distances. If we can't share firefighters, there's no one else nearby who can help us. Meanwhile, some dams in New South Wales have almost run dry this year. Winter rainfall was dismally low. Towns may run out of water. Tell us about the great drought that's afflicting Australia this year and the relationship of that to fires. Look, this is this is very, very worrying. So Sydney, which is population, has a population of um, 4.5 million, our major water supply dam is around... 48% full now. We we missed out on our winter rains. We've had some recent short, sharp rain events, which is how it happens now. They're not soaking long-term rains. We just have downpours, uh, which basically runs off and goes, goes into the ocean. We're not getting that rain over the catchments, but there's a lot of large towns and cities in New South Wales um, with populations of 30,000 up to 50,000 they're simply running out of water. Rivers have stopped flowing. Now, uh, people talked about the millennium drought, 2001, 2002, where we had massive wildfires. Uh, this is officially worse than that. It's In some areas, it's the worst drought on record. 
um, our major river system, the Murray-Darling system that runs through a number of states, uh, has basically stopped flowing a lot of areas, massive fish kills, um, huge environmental damage. But they're bringing water by trucks and trains into some towns just so people have something to drink, digging bores. And in, for firefighters, um, if we get a structure fire in a small town that doesn't have water, we, we don't use drinking water to put it out unless there's an exposure, another building around that might catch fire. The firefighters sit and let burn and just protect what's around it. So that's how serious it is. And with wildfires, um, massive areas of um, wildland, uh, it's just very, very difficult to fight the fires without water. So a lot of backfiring, backburning, a lot of dry firefighting with hand tools. But because the forests are so dry, a single spark and all the work you've done can be lost in, in minutes. So it's um, extremely difficult. But a couple of experts here on Radio EcoShock, I recall, told us that simply having hot and dry conditions isn't enough to guarantee a bad fire season. You need an ignition source, and usually around here that's lightning, but it can be humans setting fire to clear fields or forests, and then there's arson. Is there a serious intentional fire setting problem in Australia? <laughs> Look, um, I when I was commissioner or fire chief for the state, people would often ask me, what are the main causes of fire? And I'd say, well, there's three of them. It's men, women and children. Um, and that is, you know, that's, that, that is the case. People have accidents. They light fires deliberately for um, farmers, for example, burning off. At times of the year that for generations they could do that safely, now they can't and the fires are getting away. So a lot of the fires in the north of the state now are escaped burn-offs from farming activities. Um, there is arson, but uh, you know I'd like to think that's reducing. Our, our police authorities have um, done a lot of good work there. We've done a lot of public education. But we are seeing more lightning strikes. Now, you spoke about Tasmania. 2016, there were literally hundreds of lightning strikes over weeks burnt out hundreds of thousands of acres of world heritage rainforest and this is becoming with a warming environment um, I'm not a meteorologist but uh, there have been studies here saying the warmer warmer atmosphere, more unstable atmosphere is leading to more dry storms with no rain and with drier fuels fires are more likely to start when those lightning strikes hit a tree or hit a rock that um, as vegetation on it. So we're, we're getting more and more remote fires starting. Um, just last week, I think it was last week or the week before, up where we have these massive fires burning, a line of storms went through, seven new fires in 20 minutes and no rain. So this is now a common thing. Where I live in Sydney, uh, for 50, almost 50 years, lightning fires almost unheard of. We have them regularly now. We have heard that from other scientists that we can expect more lightning in a hotter world. Covering the world, this is Radio EcoShock with Alex Smith. This is Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith. Our guest is the veteran fire and emergency expert from Australia, Greg Mullins. We are watching over an early start to fire season there as climate change continues. At the end of August, the atmosphere high above the South Pole heated up. Greg, can you explain to our listeners, what is sudden stratospheric warming? Yes, well, Alex, this is something new to me, um, so I'm not entirely across it, but we, there's, there's three major drivers in Australia of um, rainfall, heat, um, and ultimately fire danger. So the first one is the El Nino effect, La Nina and El Nino. So if we have an El Nino, it's um, tropical waters in the Pacific. If the trade winds run from east to west, and that brings moisture over Australia, um, if you get a change in ocean temperatures, it does the opposite. It's in, it, it can turn westerly and it stops a lot of the rainfall coming down to Australia. We have the Indian Ocean Dipole, which again is about the warming of the ocean um, to the northwest of Australia. 
if it's cooler, there's less moisture comes across, less cloud, less rainfall. So now we don't have an El Nino, um, and I'll get back to the southern annular mode in a second. I know that's what you're interested in. Um, normally, when we have a drought like we're in now, we have an El Nino, so it's unusual that we don't, and we're getting fire seasons that are very destructive that in the past only happened during El Nino years, but now they're just sort of normal. Um, the Indian Ocean Dipole is in positive mode. That's stopping a lot of rain reaching the east coast of Australia. So then we have um, the southern annular mode. Now, that's all about the westerly wind flow around Antarctica. Now, normally it's pretty tight, um, stays to the south of Australia. Sometimes it, it's let off the leash and the winds come north and it actually brings more moisture. But what's been happening more and more is that those winds are contracting closer to Antarctica and it stops that moisture coming across the continent, particularly the southeast, where we've had 15 to 20% reduction in rainfall over decades, and this year up to 50% reduction in a lot of areas. Um, so that's the southern annular mode, and um, the stratospheric warming over Antarctica, which you know I do admit I'm, I don't fully understand. I'm not a meteorologist, uh, but apparently that could cause us to have drier, um, but more windy conditions in southern Australia, which is our most hazardous place for, for bushfires. So we're bracing ourselves. We're already in drought. We've had record high temperatures. We had the highest fire danger index has ever recorded in September in New South Wales and Queensland, two adjoining states, on the 6th of September. So the first week of September... Uh, not the last week of September, we had what we call catastrophic fire conditions in the US it's called red flag conditions, but way off the scale. And that's when our massive fires really took off. So it's months and months ahead. So all these ingredients are just, they're pointing to a horror scenario. Everybody's really worried about this summer because we're not in summer yet. We're just into spring, beginning spring, and we've, We've got massive fire problems already. I'm also trying to understand this sudden stratospheric warming thing. It, it appears that the polar vortex reverses, and it, it happens fairly often in the northern hemisphere, I understand, and we just had one that dragged a heat wave west from Europe over Greenland, sort of against the normal jet stream. But the, the only other sudden warming that I could find happened at the South Pole appears to be in 2002, and now we're seeing one again, and I wonder if this large-scale disturbance will happen more often and affect Australia uh, more often as well. Well, look, this is uh, again. I'm not. I'm not really au okay fait with this, but with the this is the problem. Um, we're having more and more heat waves. 2002, when the climatologists told us that was the last time it happened here, that made all of the fire chiefs sit back in horror because that was one of our really bad fire years. So we lost, there were lots of homes lost that year, um, massive fires across Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia, Western Australia. So there were massive fires in 2002 basically across the whole continent. Uh, and if we're looking at that after we've been in severe drought since 2017, um, our water supplies are dwindling and non-existent in many areas. <laughs> We're really worried, really, really worried. I hear what you're saying, and it, it sounds pretty scary to me. I, I would like to get to... You're with the Climate Council in Australia, and I didn't know a lot about it, but could you tell our listeners what it is and the interesting way that council got going? Yes, so it was an interesting... Um, so uh, around a bit over five years ago, um, an incoming Conservative government decided that the Climate Commission, with the Chief Climate Commissioner, um, Dr Tim Flannery, who was a former Australian of the Year, a scientist who rang the alarm bells on climate change years ago, has written a lot of books, he was the Chief Climate Commissioner and a number of other people were Climate Commissioners. Um, they'd come up with the carbon price, emissions were going down, so the incoming Prime Minister, one of his first acts within a couple of weeks was to abolish the council. I won't say he, he had a famous statement, 
or an infamous statement about uh, what he thought of climate change. I won't repeat it because he used a word starting with C, ending with P. Uh, <laughs> said it was uh, it was rubbish. He didn't believe in it. So within weeks, the community had rallied and crowdfunded the Climate Council to re-emerge. And so it's community-funded, and it's about keeping government honest. So it's a lot of experts in various areas, um, climate scientists, of course, people like me, I'm a um, fire expert, uh, natural disasters. So we write a lot of papers. We interpret the scientific papers and make it digestible. So and look, if people, um, people can Google it, climatecouncil.org.au, um, there's a lot of papers on different things there, but we keep try to keep the government honest and we're not doing very well with that. We've just heard our Prime Minister telling the world that he doesn't need to take much action on climate change, but he'll clean the oceans up with plastic and that'll fix everything. So that's what we're up against here. So Climate Council is working with other bodies to try and get real action on climate change, which is the base cause of what we're facing. Is the current government listening when it comes to increasing fire danger as this warming continues? No. <laughs> they're in denial. Um, it's, so they're ideologically driven. It's all about business and profit. So our government is telling the world that they're doing their bit with the Paris Accord. Our, our missions in Australia have gone up each year for the last five years of this government, not down. So the way they're going to meet the Paris targets is to use leftover credits from the Kyoto Agreement because we overachieved on our extremely low targets, I think second lowest emissions targets in the Kyoto Agreement. So it's dodgy accounting and it's an embarrassment to most Australians who know what's going on. Um, so Australia is not doing its bit on the world stage to help reduce emissions and the job of the Climate Council is to try and raise awareness of this. And we had massive rallies in all of the major cities last week, school children, but people went on strike from their jobs. Some companies shut down for the day to go and show their support. So there's a massive awareness, over 80% in Australia, of the climate problem and the need for action, but our government remains in denial. That sounds very familiar here in Canada. We're in a similar situation. Perhaps the talk is better in Canada, but the actual action of expanding the tar sands pipelines uh, puts us right in with Australia in expanding coal for export. We're, we're in the same basket. My wonder is whether the bush that is burning in Australia, it's used to fire. There's been a long history of fire there, in, in some parts of Australia at least, but maybe it'll fail to recover with climate change and, and maybe that desert that fills the interior of your continent will expand. Your thoughts? That, that's an interesting thought, Alex, because each area has a fire regime and the fire regime, um, ecologists say it, it, it's based on history going back tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. So species of plant evolve that can withstand the frequency and intensity of fire that's common over that huge time frame. However, a short time frame of some decades, the fires are becoming more intense and more frequent. So we're seeing um, where I live, I live near the coast in Sydney. I'm looking, looking out my window at the ocean at the moment. Beautiful, but we have coastal heath land, uh, native heath land that burns very intensely and if it doesn't burn within about 20 years, um, it can start to break down because it needs fire to germinate new seeds. But if you burn it more than once every five years, after the, about the third fire, there's no seed stocks stock left in the soil and um, that, it can be eradicated forever from, from certain areas. And we're starting to see that. We're starting to see certain species... Uh, removed from areas because of the frequent burning and what come, what tend to come in are weeds and grasses that regenerate every year and will burn every year. So it actually increases our fire problem where fuel reduction burning or wildfires would remove the problem for three to five years as it regrew 
I know the time, if you get these um, fire weeds come in and ferns and things, you've, you've changed the whole biota and you lose animal species as well. I had a plan for this show for September and unexpectedly ended up having to cover fires in the Amazon, in Alaska and Siberia. We're talking in Angola, Indonesia, terrible smoke problems there and fires. And so I'm seeing that fires have become an international emergency. Greg Mullins, what are you hearing from other fire and emergency experts around the world? Look, it, it, there's concern everywhere. And I, I've been, you know, believe it or not, I've been over to the United Kingdom twice during my career to help them gear up to fight bushfires. And in, in England, really? It, it just never happened. And fundamental things like um, the structural firefighting uniforms were too hot because the temperatures were going up there. Their hoses were too large and um, going into areas where there was no reticulated water, so they had to have smaller diameter hoses and they had to start to use aircraft. Command and control of large events, you know, talking to other fire chiefs about how they do that. But look, I'll point to California. As I, I worry about us facing the same as California did last year and the year before of Fort fires in California back in 1995. I've got friends in the fire service there. I, I speak to Ken Pimlot, who recently retired as um, Cal Fire Chief. And I've seen what bark beetles have done to the forests in California, how a lot of dead trees has increased the fuel loads, um, the longer seasons. And look at the number of homes that were lost last year. In, in Paradise um, and other, other townships and the massive fires. I just keep breaking records of the largest fire, Mendocino Fire, the Camp Fire. Uh, you know, thousands and thousands of homes. And I, if this isn't ringing alarm bells around the world for people and having fires in places like Greenland and Sweden and Canary Islands and then massive losses of lives in fire-prone areas that are getting worse, like Greece, Portugal... Spain, that, you know, nearly 100 dead in California last year, 173 dead in Australia in 2009, um, over one afternoon, thousands of homes lost. It's just supercharged. And you, you can no longer sit back and say, nothing to see here, move on everybody, there's no such thing as climate change. So world leaders like in Australia, like in the USA, I have to say, I think it's really up to people to take local action, like California is doing, like my state is doing in Australia, bypass the national governments who are in denial, and we have to take action to save our planet. Good message, Greg. Thank you. We've been speaking with fire and rescue expert Greg Mullins. He is a world-recognized expert on fires, currently with the Climate Council of Australia. Thank you so much for bringing us up to date. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for getting this message out. I'm Alex Smith for Radio EcoShock. You're listening to EcoShock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org. <laughs> 